tell I did, I did, I did, yeah, I did it right well Welcome back to another episode of Husky Talk. We are a little under two weeks away from the start of the di- of the Iditarod. Our guest today is a familiar is familiar with the Iditarod in more than one way. He has been on the Iditarod Trail both on bike and sled dog. This next weekend, he will be competing in the Iditarod Trail in an invitational 350 mile bike race. The following weekend, his wife Christy Burlington, no Burlington, will start the 1,000 mile Iditarod. I did a rod dog. Oh, I did a rod dog sled race. Please welcome to the show, Andy Full. Full. That's horrible. Oh well. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> uh, hello, Andy. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Can you start us? Can you start us off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Um. Well, everybody starts with uh, born and raised in Alaska, so I've uh, been in Alaska all my life and enjoyed uh the state from corner to corner uh i've had the opportunity to travel to many places but uh i keep coming back here and always call alaska home uh leading into i did a rod uh or pre i did a rod i should say uh went to university at uaf and fairbanks alaska and i uh, got a math uh mechanical engineering degree and then pursued a career as a mechanical engineer and a construction project engineer uh for 20 some years and then through in between had adventures along the side a lot of it dealing with uh, bike and bike travel and racing and that branched into meeting a lot of really cool people and dog mushing so you're pretty familiar with the Iditarod trail you have been on the trail both on fat tire bike and behind dogs in the sled dog race. Can you explain to us what the Iditarod Trail Invitational is? The Iditarod Trail Invitational is a human powered version of the Iditarod sled dog race. Uh, it starts a week before the Iditarod. So the trail breakers go out uh, with snow machines, primarily for the Iron Dog, which is a snow machine race that left last week. And they're out on the course right now, hopefully putting in a good trail through the new snow. And then the human powered version, the Iditarod Trail Invitation, we'll call it the ITI for short, uh, goes out and you can either choose bike, ski, walk. They like to say it's running, uh, but they eventually end up into more of a walking pace, getting over the Alaska range. And then the week after that is the uh, Iditarod Sled Dog Race. So the trail in March or the end of February gets pretty busy here in Alaska. Mm -hmm. How did you get involved in long distance fat tire biking? Um, it kind of started as I needed one more bike. You know, you got to have one more. I already had a mountain bike and a road bike, and then it was a snow bike. And the snow bike development in technology, the ability to have fatter tires and uh, wider spacing to, to handle uh, the extra width of the tires to ride, be able to ride on snow developed and got better and better. And then pretty soon, once you can ride on trails, you just go further and further. But the idea of doing long distance sports, um, kind of became, I became, I was a better long distance runner earlier, like in, in junior high and high school and then in cross country skiing. And that just, when I got into bike racing, uh the sprint races were not necessarily my forte but the longer distance the 100 milers the races that lasted 10 hours or more and sometimes uh even a 400 mile race uh in the summer uh but then into the snow the first time i did the i did a ride trail on a snow bike was kind of a my friends kind of egged me on and said hey you're you got the gear and you've got the experience to do it you're not in the race but just go do the trail see how far you go down the trail and so i loaded up my stuff on my bike and hit the trail, left Willow the day before I did a uh, sled dog race uh, with my snow bike and all my winter camping gear. And that was in 2014. So that was my uh, introduction to the ultra long snow bike riding. In 2014 and 15, you explored the Iditarod Trail self-supported on your bike. Tell us about this experience. Uh the last question kind of led right into that. Very good. Uh, so 2014, I left Willow um, from a friend's house. Um, and the plan was because I was self-supported, I wanted to make sure that there's other people out on the trail. To, so I had a trail to ride. 
and I didn't want to get stranded out there. I knew there was going to be other supports, hopefully, with I did run the uh, trail sweeps um, as kind of a a safe net in case everything totally went bad. I never ended up seeing them. but uh, So I took off down the trail, and the trail was in great shape, well marked in preparation for Iditarod. Uh, my plan was to go to McGrath originally and going over the Alaska range was beautiful. The trail was in fantastic sh shape. I'd never been out there. Uh, met a lot of cool people at the checkpoints along the way. They're all pretty amazed. It's like, hey, what are you doing out here on a snow bike? <laughs> but uh, I got to McGrath and the people who host the ITI, the guy at the last checkpoint there said, uh, hey, did you ride here on a snow bike? I said, yeah. Said, well, you're coming with me. I'm, I'm not part of the event. He's like, no, you're you're coming to my house. He fed me and resupplied me. And then I continued on down the trail to my, to Galena, where the weather turned um, a little more miserable and I ended up flying out of Galena. But that was in 2014. In 2015, I decided to go back for unfinished business. And that year, the Iditarod started in Fairbanks, so I went up to Fairbanks and loaded all my camp, loaded all my winter camping gear on the snow bike again, and took off out of Fairbanks. And that year, I uh, hit all the checkpoints and made it all the way to Nome in about 15 days. So that was a, quite the adventure. Got through some winter storms and the worst winter weather you can imagine. How how did how did you carry food you needed? Um, food, yeah, let's see. I started out with a, a nice food bag on my bike. I want to say my food bag when I was self-supported was between 15 and 20 pounds. Some of it was dried food that would need like uh, boiling water to heat up. A lot of it was, uh, like I had a, a, pound, a one pound or a pound and a half block of cheese and two pounds of sandwich meat and some bagels and I had fig newtons fig newtons are some of my favorites mm -hmm. uh but I say when you're traveling or you're doing a bike tour or even a hiking trip a happy happiness is a full food bag so as long as you got food uh you're usually pretty good and then out along the trail I befriended some of the mushers and the mushers would drop me like bags of candy and stuff as they go by because they send out all their uh, goodies on the trail and they have, oh, they obviously overpack. So they, I was able to glean a little extra candy and treats from them, which helped supplement what I was having. Assuming that you had water with you, did it freeze at all? Oh yeah, water. <laughs> water is um, a constant battle, especially when it gets well below 20 below 40 below uh you start out in the day with your uh like a nalgene thermos bottle uh you fill it up with boiling water and then you put it in an insulated sleeve and then you can tuck that inside of another bag so it uh it doesn't freeze as quick also a good tip is put the lid of your water bottle or upside down so that the water's hitting the lid because water always freezes at the top, so the bottom of the water bottle will be frozen, maybe. But you turn it over, you can still unscrew your lid. But if your lid freezes on, you're going to be knocking at odd stuff, trying to unfreeze your water bottles. But your last reserve, you put it where a camelback inside your clothing, and that always uh, stays thawed. How, how long did it take you to finish? Uh, the, it was a solo adventure? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah the, so I took... Uh, the year I went from Fairbanks to Nome, I spent 15 days on the trail. And the year I went from Willow to Galena, which is uh, a little over halfway, probably about 600 miles down the trail, I spent uh, eight days on the trail that year. Is it easier to stay warm since you're doing physical activity? Yes. Yes. Uh, keep moving. Uh, if your feet get cold with a bike, it's you can warm them back up. Uh, if you get off the bike and run or push your bike at the same time, it helps get the blood flow back to your toes. Uh, you do have to manage that you don't overdress. Uh, you don't want to sweat too much and create your inner layers. You don't want them to get wet. Uh, it takes a lot of effort to try to dry stuff out when it's really cold or your winter camping. So managing, managing your perspiration and your layers is uh, key to uh, endurance or physical activities in the winter. Where did you sleep? 
Uh, the first couple nights, um, I was what we call bivvying, slept in the snow. Uh, I put down a small tarp and a uh, uh, insulated pad and a sleeping bag right next to the trail. Um, uh, one year was along a river. The, I think the second stop was near a, a couple spruce underneath. It was like 40 below out of Fairbanks that year. And the key to that was I had a stove along the way and took those water bottles as I was describing, filled them full of boiling water. And you put one of those, put one of those down by the, your toes and you put the other one kind of around your torso and uh, those extra hot water bottles in your bag make a big difference to being able to be comfortable at night. But uh, other times later in the trail, there's some public use cabins and uh, they're not warm, but they're dry and a hard flat spot to sleep. So that's very nice. Mm -hmm. During your time on the trail, you met a musher, now your wife, Christy Barrington. Can you talk to us about that? Uh, that was in 2014 when I first met her. Um, I was biking, and the checkpoint of Ophir. Uh, I was spending the night there. The uh, people who owned the cabins there for the checkpoint were kind enough to let me in. They gave me a meal, which was very nice. Uh, then I noticed, or I should say Christy and Anna, they were outside for their 24 hour in the sled dog race. And I didn't know it, but they were checking out my bike and gear outside the cabin. And I was inside the cabin. They came in and spotted me and wanted to get a picture taken. And uh, we talked a little bit about ultras distance events because they were interested in marathons and longer stuff we got a picture taken um and that was about it in 2014 and 2015 when i went to fairbanks and started we got another i saw her again at the starting line uh next to the ice sculptures and we got another picture there this time i got her phone number and uh when got all, when she got all the way to know she sent me a message asking me if i had made it to know I said, no, I was still in Elam. But she said, oh, okay, well, how long will it be here? She, But she already left known by the time I got there. And so I gave, sent her a message, asked her for a kennel tour uh, when I got back to Anchorage. And that's kind of how I first met her. She gave me a kennel tour of her dogs and, and a four-wheeler ride. <laughs> that's cool. After meeting Christy, you got to see the trail in a different way, behind dogs. You finished the Iditarod sled dog race in 2018. Tell us about this experience. Oh, that was quite the journey. Uh, the buildup of, you know, I always had a dog growing up, but nothing compared to sled dogs. Uh, so after I met Christy, I got kind of thrown into it, into, you know, the top end of the sport. I kind of skipped the little junior ranks that some people worked their way up through and uh, started doing uh, the middle distance races in preparation for doing Iditarod, which happened in 2018. Uh, she, she and her sister Anna taught me a lot, taught me everything they know about uh, dog mushing, anything from the care of the dogs and the nutrition and how to put together, put a team together, uh, managing all your gear uh, and nutrition for the dogs. Uh, that, But that was quite the journey. We got married in 2017, and so 2018 Iditarod was – Probably the closest thing we had to a honeymoon <laughs> out on the out on the trail. We we traveled the trail leapfrogging each other that year. Uh, but that was a very memorable journey being able to do the I did around with Christy. This past weekend, you finished this Susitna one hundred mile bike race. Tell us about this. So this was my ninth uh, finish of the Susitna one hundred. Uh, it was a pretty epic year. It's We've had a lot of snow this year, and the trails have not set up a whole lot. So the race course was very soft, which makes it very difficult for riding. Uh, there are very few finishers this year because of the soft conditions. A lot of people were left to pushing their bike for miles and miles out there because of the trail conditions hadn't set up. Uh, a lot of uh, competitors at the awards banquet last night were saying how hard it was compared to every other year for me yes it was hard and i was pretty happy to finish uh being able to take you take advantage of the checkpoints to recover after you're exhausted out there and then continue on uh was 
the key to my success to be able to take a nap at about mile 65 and then get a nice big breakfast and continue on. This year, it took me about 25 hours. Other years, I've done it as short as nine hours. So it's, it's trail conditions can uh, greatly affect the outcome of the race. Mm-hmm. Next weekend, you'll be starting the ITI 350 mile bike race. What are some things you, what are some, some things you do to prepare for a race this season and the extreme weather? Uh, let's see. I'll start with the extreme weather. First thing is know your gear, know what you got, know what you need. Uh, be a little overprepared. There's really no place out. There is no place out there to get uh, more gear if you do get, uh, if you run into bad weather. So a lot of the gear we're carrying is uh pretty bulky and heavy uh other preparations uh going up for long distance rides during the week um being conditioned your innate race um having good nutrition for your body is key and then practice uh riding like the susitna 100 was a perfect preparation it was hard it's harder than i wanted but it put me in a good mindset to know how hard I can go and be prepared for this next race. So I think even though it was physically taxing this last weekend, uh, it was good preparation physically and mentally, and also a good gear check to make sure I had everything I needed for this next week's ITI. Are there checkpoints along the way like there are on the sled dog races? There are. Yeah, there's a, a couple mandatory checkpoints that you got to go and sign in on there like i did a rod there's there's two checkpoints out there that you can send out a drop bag uh, i did a rod you're allowed i think up to three 50 pound bags per checkpoint and there's 20 checkpoints on i did a rod uh for our race there's six checkpoints i think you gotta sign into uh but two of them you can send out uh a five pound bag of gear and you're allowed to send out uh, hand warmers, food, and batteries. That's about it that you can... And five pounds fills up pretty quick at those checkpoints. I'll find out what it's like. I haven't been to an ITI checkpoint yet. Uh, sometimes there's lodging at them. Sometimes they have food. What kind of food they offer? Who knows? It might be a can of soup. It might be a hot dog. I, I don't know. I hope it's better, more than that. <laughs> mm-hmm. What do you think is the biggest challenge you will face during the race? Sleep deprivation. <laughs> that's that's my biggest one uh the race starts at two in the afternoon so you don't go very far or you don't have very many hours left of daylight until it gets dark and there's that witching hour i want to say it's between like 1 a.m and 5 a.m when it's dark it's the coldest time of the night uh that seems to be the hardest part for me uh is the sleep deprivation and going too far too long into a night uh, if you can get for me if i can get that four hours during that time of sleep and actually rest stop and reset the body uh it, that makes a uh that helps a lot and then there's just the soft snow nobody likes windblown soft drifted snow that you have to push through that's just you got tires you want to roll you don't want to push mm-hmm. do you think you will ever do the 1000 mile version uh, going to Nome, it's a good possibility. Uh, let's tackle this 350 first. Uh, but I am going to ride a snow machine to Nome again, uh, later this year after the ITI. That's a fun journey, but, uh, but it's possible. The thousands are possible right now. I'm focused on the 350 and I'm looking forward to that event. Biking or dog sled? Oh, wait, sorry. Do you think you'll be back in time to watch Christy start the Iditarod the next weekend? I sure hope so. Um, I have it planned out to be able to do it in five days, which uh, gets me in, uh, to McGrath in time to catch the flight out on a Friday uh, back to Anchorage. And then the ceremony will start on Saturday and the official on Sunday. But judging by the new snow that we've been getting and this last weekend's uh, deep snow in the Susitna 100, uh, there's snow in the forecast for um, uh, for points out on the trail. So it makes me nervous. Having fresh new snow out there, it slows you down. So it might take me seven days. I might not make it. 
I mean, I might not make it back in time just for the official start if I did a ride. Mm -hmm. Biking or dog sledding? The trail. Which one do you think is more challenging? Mm. Dog sledding. Uh, physically, biking is more challenging, but you put all of the elements together, I'd say the uh, dog machine is a harder event. Uh, you're not just responsible for yourself. You're also responsible for the care of all the dogs in front of you and making sure they're fed and well taken care of. Uh, there's a lot more moving items and a lot more preparation that goes into uh, mushing the Iditarod Trail. Our final question is the dinner party. You were able to invite five Iditarod icons to dinner, living or dead. Who would you invite to your dinner party? You could choose from either the sled dog or human power grace. Hmm. Well, uh, that's a good one. Um, I'll start with some of the uh, legends. Um, I always uh, was was a fan of uh, Martin Boozer. I think I think he contributed a lot to the sport, the development of the gear, and what it took to do the races. And I always liked his attitude. He's always f happy, go lucky guy. Um. I'd also inv invite uh, the other legend, uh, Lance Mackey, because he always, I mean, he was a legend himself, but he always gave great interviews. He always had this bigger than life personality and he spoke from his heart about the dogs. And um, there's a buddy of, a couple buddies of mine who were on my uh, bike team for uh, when I was racing uh, for uh, Speedway Cycles, and they're pretty legendary in uh, the ITI. John Lackey and Tim Bernston, they were good buddies of mine. I'd bring them back. And probably the last one, I got to invite my wife because uh, mm -hmm. Christy's, Christy's taught me just about everything I know about dog mushing, and I'd love to have her around. Mm -hmm. We believe when you finish, you will be the only one to have finished both the ITI and the Iditarod. Good luck. Oh, thank you. Yep. All right, thank there's you. A, there, I'd oh. like to shout out. There's another uh, musher biker, Becca Moore. She's also done the Iditarod, and she's also done the uh, uh, the ITI 350. Oh, yeah, so. I forgot about that. Was that last year? Uh, she did the ITI last year, and actually her and I were rookies together in the Iditarod in 2018. I think she's done Iditarod twice uh, with the with the dogs and uh, done the ITI. Special thanks to our guest, Andy Pohl, for being on our show this week. If you enjoyed this episode, please stop by iTunes and leave us a review. It helps with our ratings. Also, if you have any questions, comments, or people you would like to hear on the show, email us, email us at huskytalk1 at gmail.com. If we hear from you, if we hear, hear from you or you leave a review, we will read it on the show. We would like to also give credit to Hobo Jim for our intro song, the I Did Rod Trail song, and our outro song, Ready, Reading Tunes Run. Right. In the land of the midnight okay. sun, mm, they call this race the I Did Rod Trail. To me, it's Reading Tunes Run. In my heart, it's Reading Tunes Run.